Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypt News Podcast. We are buzzing as always, coming in hot. Our guest today from the one and only London, England. What a treat, one of the best cities in the world. Today we have Humayen Sheikh, the founder and CEO of Fetch.ai. He is an entrepreneur, investor, and tech visionary who's passionate about technologies such as AI, machine learning, autonomous agents, and blockchain. In the past, he was a founding investor in DeepMind, where he supported commercialization for early stage AI and deep neural network technology. Currently, he is leading Fetch.ai as CEO and co-founder, a startup building the autonomy of the future. Human is also an expert on the topics of artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous agents, and everything blockchain and commodities related. Been a while, pumped to have you on. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? It's a pleasure. It's great to speak to you guys. I'm really quite excited. Exciting times for AI. It's crazy. You and the team started building this well in advance. I think a good place to start would be, before we get into sort of your journey into the crypto space, I'd love to hear any stories related to the early days of DeepMind. And I know you were a founding investor in DeepMind. DeepMind is obviously one of the most important AI and neural network technology companies in our beautiful world. And uh, I'd just love if you could share anything interesting or crazy or funny or anything of the like with us from the days at DeepMind. It's been a while now, um, I think uh, probably 13 years, 12, 13 years. And when I remember when we started it, we were sitting in a restaurant in Cambridge and uh, Demis and I, uh, obviously Demis is a friend who kind of was always working on games. And uh, I remember exactly the conversation we were having is that, uh, yeah, we should start a company which can actually build AGI, which was, you know, Demis's passion. And I wrote the first check there and then that was the first check which went in the company, which, which was great. I think the more interesting bit about DeepMind was that the biggest problem we were having, which I think is also quite obvious these days, is the compute, the training, the amount of money it was costing to compute and train these models. That was one of the biggest problems then. It still is the biggest problem now. And the second point I want to kind of think about and raise is how do you monetize these models, right? You can only monetize it for big corporations if they come in either buy you out, which is what happened with DeepMind, because that was the best option. I mean, uh, yeah, Google had, you know, greatest compute in the world. You know, you could take it. It has a lot of data on people. It has a lot of data generally. So where the applications are is with big corporations. That was very clear. And when I came out of it, that was one of the passions which I have is how do you take all these machine learning models, which is going to be the gold, you know, it's not going to be just data, it's going to be these machine learning models. There will be a machine learning model for everything, right? So how do you take that and how do you commercialize it so that everybody can have a participation in it? And that was kind of the start of the Fetch journey. And that's how we kind of got into starting Fetch. And um, yeah, not looked back since that. So Humayn, give me the inception story. Like, how did you get started in AI? Because obviously it's the biggest topic present day. It's it's the crypto of 2020 and 2021 and early 2022, where it was the creme de la creme, the talk of the town. Everyone wanted to get into it. It seemed like the biggest and brightest thing. Present day, this is what AI is. You obviously got in years and years ago. You said DeepMind was started 13 years ago, which is bananas. What was it about AI or who introduced you or what was the catalyst? What was that thing or person that got you into the field of AI? Where I started from was computer science. So we we were always in kind of AI, you know, because you start from algorithms and you start building. Then, then there was a very obvious transition to building machine learning models. And I was in the gaming industry where Demis and I had kind of been involved in a game which was about kind of building these agents playing game against each other. So, you know, it's the gaming industry which kind of started this for me, perhaps. And it became quite clear that compute, the infrastructure wasn't right at that point, And the machine learning models were not well trained, partly because the data wasn't available. But once you get over that hurdle, then you could see this kind of was the future of almost everything. So AI, we all have been using AI in, you know, different parts of our lives 
for a very long time. So it's not new. I think what's changed now is really just this focus which OpenAI brought in in terms of the large language models. And because the training is becoming cheaper and cheaper and more affordable and the actual algorithms are getting better. If you look at these large language models, I mean, we started in 1970s or something. So it's not machine learning models are new, not new. Predictions are not new. Uh, we have used them. Bigger companies have used them. All the aggregators, I mean, recommendation systems, you know, including uh, Google's um, ad system, they all have used machine learning and AI. Uh, I mean, Siri, Apple phones, you know, any of these things use machine learning and AI. So it's not new. I think it's the, the focus is that now everything else has moved on. The compute is available and possible to train models. And you could see that this whole connection, there is going to be a paradigm shift. That's what's going to come next. So just to kind of reiterate, nothing is, this is not completely new. This is just an evolution at this stage. Yeah, it's finally finally getting trendy now. Very interesting. One of the other really big topics, AI related, is the race to grab chips. Obviously, you have Nvidia that is, you know, their stock is what hundred X in the last year or two, whatever the case may be. But what's going on with the race for chips? And to my knowledge, obviously, it's great. And I'm Canadian. I'm not American. But you know, on our edge of the pond, if you will, it's great that the USA does have a behemoth in an industry, in a manufacturing industry that is becoming extremely and ever more important. But like, what's what's the end game here with chips? Is it going to be similar to a, you know, a, a chip for a computer where, or a phone where years ago they were hundreds of thousands of dollars and the size of a house and now they're, you know, just a couple millimeters and very, very cheap. Like, is it going to follow in the same trajectory? What's the deal there? Yeah, why is it becoming so important? One of the reasons why it's becoming so important is obviously these models are big. You need to train them. Some of them are general models, which are even bigger, but then you have to train the specific models. So every industry, every player who needs to do something in this space needs to be training these models. Now, the couple of things which which I see happening is the models are going to get better. So the data and the training required is going to start reducing. And that's that's already happening. I've seen plenty of deep mind work on that. Uh, so you wouldn't have to train it that intensely. I mean, you could have less parameters and it will be better predictions in terms of what it predicts, what it says. So that's going to happen on one side. The other side, as you mentioned, NVIDIA and the chips are need to be there. Every industry needs to have some ability, some compute to train. So you're going to see a lot more research into making these GPUs, the chips which are going to do maybe edge computing, edge training of models. So at the moment, that's where the trend is going to go. So we will see huge improvement in the chip technology, but there is limitations right now and we don't know how far we can go. Maybe a quantum mechanics kind of will come in at some point and things will change dramatically if, if it happens. But we're not there yet. So initially we're just going to keep on following Orr's law. And I think we kind of broke that a long time ago. So hopefully that will have to happen. But one thing that definitely needs to also happen is needs to become more accessible. The governments, the regulators, uh, you know, the industry people need to focus on getting the cost down so small businesses, small to medium enterprise can also play a part in it. Otherwise, it kind of sits in this huge, big corporation control. As you've seen from all the fundraisers that have been, we've been seeing, 100 million, 200 million, majority of that funding is actually going on compute. So the infrastructure of compute is what is getting commoditized, but it's not there yet. Interesting. Yeah, it's crazy. These multi-hundred million dollar raises and a big chunk of it is literally going to chips. It's it's absolutely bananas. Let's jump into a topic that interests the absolute hell out of me, and that is autonomous software agents. I sort of started my AI journey last year when everything sort of popped off, just jumping on the trend, tried to become, you know, a 10x prompt engineer, if you will. Obviously, I'm nowhere close to that, but stealing the you know the classic 10x engineer from coding and developing, and now there are 10x prompters, people who just really know how to jig and jag and game the obviously you know ChatGPT to get exactly what you want out of it, be more efficient and get more. Been screwing around with Stable Diffusion and all of the you know Mid Journey and, and Dali and all the incredible image generators. 
bunch of different AI tools as well. But the thing that really, really intrigues me is autonomous software agents. I saw a bunch of YouTube videos earlier in 2023 about how you can create an autonomous software agent, which then literally keeps doing those steps for you. I still don't fully understand this, Humane. I'd love if you could take a nice little deep dive, give us the TLDR, maybe just high level. Don't go too crazy, nitty gritty. You know, try to explain it to as if I was a five-year-old. But if you could jump into that, that that'd be a treat. Yeah. So if I take you through kind of the journey here, we have multiple things happening, right? So one one of the things uh, is automation. So you can just write a script. You can write a algorithm which um, you know kind of evaluates certain parameters and then does certain tasks. So that's easy to code in software. If you know exactly what the measurements need to be, if you know exactly where the data is coming from, when it becomes a little bit more autonomous, whereby you don't know what the data looks like, you don't know what the action looks like, you have to predict all of those things before you actually carry out the action itself, then that's kind of becoming more intelligent, right? So when we say, okay, if this happens, do this. If this, then that kind of statement, that's not really you know, anything. It's a, it's a very simple step. But just so that we kind of frame it in the right way. So robotic process automation, which is called RPA, has been happening for the last you know five, seven years. Call center is a very good example of that, where in a call center, the, the process automation companies actually enable you to make it simpler. So where you're managing these huge call centers, the data is being managed by these, you know, robotic agents. So that's been around for quite a while. But these are very specific things which uh, listen in to your conversation and take the trigger or easily kind of provides you information to like attend the call center. And that then kind of started expanding into other complex processes where it's a menial task, but somebody still has to do it. And you have to teach somebody to do it so you could automate that. That's been happening in parallel. But what happened with uh, the large language models is that we started kind of, I mean, I say understanding. It's not really true understanding yet, but you start actually breaking down the objective, what you give to this language model, and you actually start seeing what you know, a bit more intelligent response to that would be. That's also a progression of natural language processing. And Combined with that, now if you start introducing these, this ability to kind of build a context and then break it up into smaller chunks to understand what the objective actually entails, now that's the interesting part. And that's where the OpenAI chat GPT kind of led us into. Now, what's quite obvious is that once you have, for example, you give the objective into this large language model, what comes out of that is mostly text. So a software agent takes that text and actually converts that into actions. These actions can then be carried out intelligently and autonomously. So humans don't have to carry out those tasks. For example, if I say I am going to go for lunch somewhere, you and I, we both understand that by lunch, we mean a certain time. By lunch, we mean, you know, going out for lunch means there is some kind of restaurant or we're we going to go to a food place. We're going to go out to lunch with somebody and there will be a particular time. So all these contextual information needs to be first picked up by this software agent. It then needs to be composed in a way that it's broken down into tasks. And those tasks then actually ultimately need to be executed. At this point in time, it's us. So if we say you need to book a taxi, you need to get to this location to book a taxi there, you have to go and say, Uber, I need a taxi to this place. Right. Then you say, oh, uh, there is a restaurant. I need to book the restaurant. So I go to open table and I go and say, okay, I'm going to book this restaurant. So those are the processes which are conversions of this objective that you have. Now, if you take that and then you give it to this software agent, and that's to answer your question, what kind of things does an agent do is it automates that process. But at the moment, you can't hard code every agent for every kind of objective. Because the objective is so varied, you can't cover everything. But what this combination of LLMs combined with these software agents, combined with context, what it enables you to do 
is to start doing these tasks with less onus on the doer and more onus on the agents. So you can just say, I need, this is my task. You put your phone down and just like your private secretary or somebody who can actually do all these tasks for you knows you. So knows what kind of food you like, knows where you like to go, just books it and confirms it to you. So that's the interesting bit. Now, if you start thinking where we are going with this. So hopefully that answers your kind of, in a roundabout way, answers your question. That was great. No, that, that, was, that was truly great. How far out are we from having full-on autonomous agents that can do exactly what you described? Matt and Humayun want to have a nice dinner in London at XYZ restaurant and the autonomous agent, I literally just be like, hey, book me a restaurant at blah, blah, blah. It does it all. Like how, how far out are we till that happens? We're not very far because that's doable right now on Fetch. So our platform enables you to integrate things to it whereby you can carry out all that execution. And that's right now. When I say right now, it's technically possible. What is not possible yet is that this new evolution of marketplace has not happened. So not everybody understands that this whole search and discovery is going to completely change. So at the moment, if you have to search for a restaurant, you have to go somewhere you have to say, I want a restaurant and you find one. Then you see if the timing is available, you are doing that work. But what needs to happen is that this whole kind of has to be turned on its head, whereby your agent does the work. So all these restaurants, we need to have some presence in this new kind of ecosystem, this new e-commerce world. And that's what's not happened yet. So the technology is very much available. I mean, we, we know that because we're building that technology and we'll be showcasing end-to-end -end demos very soon where it takes an LLM or multiple LLMs, it chooses the right LLMs and then it executes multiple tasks and it informs the user or asks for choices and it executes the task and lets you know all of those things are very possible at the moment. So we're not far at all now. Of course, this will keep improving. Uh, but what this means is a complete paradigm shift. Really, what's going to happen is this uh, online advertising model uh, in certain cases is going to change. I'm not saying that the textual searches might be more interesting as well. But, you know, this is where the true revenue models are going to be generated. So cool. Humane, we got to take a quick break and give a huge shout out to our sponsor of the show, Prime XBT. And when we get back, we are going to keep diving into Fetch.ai, the intersection of crypto and AI, and some more Fetch related stuff like micro agents and the agent first. But before then, huge shout out to our sponsor of the show, that is Prime XBT, longtime friends of cryptonews.com. And Generally, just incredible people. The whole team is PrimeXPT offers a robust trading system for both beginners and professional traders. Doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a vet, you can easily design and customize your layouts and widgets to best fit your trading style. PrimeXPT is running an exclusive promotion for listeners of the Crypto News podcast. The promo code is CryptoNews50 and that will give you 50% of your first deposit credited to your account that can be used as additional collateral to open positions. Again, the promo code is CryptoNews50, all one word, that is CryptoNews50 to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. Now back to the show with Humayun. Let's jump right into Agentverse, which is sort of the sandbox for experimentation, learning how to use the browser, discovering other agents. It's really sort of the HQ of anything agent related. I'd love if you could take a deep dive into that and give a couple of use cases for people who perhaps are not as technologically advanced like myself that could hopefully participate in the agent verse. Yeah. So just to kind of dig into that, let me set the scene first. So we talked about LLMs, right? Let's say you somehow input your objective. You write a piece of text which says, I want to travel to London. I'm going to travel with my family and these are my dates or not even say that, but I want you to arrange my travel, right? Now, if you go to ChatGPT and you say, do this, it will go and give you in exact detail what you should do and how you should do it. But it stops there. 
It's you read it and you think, okay, that's great. But what do I do now? So now you go and do the work yourself, right? So now you take it to the next stage where you input this objective. It kind of tells you all the tasks that you need to do. Then it starts connecting you to, I mean, which, which is the functions bit, which has come in. You can start connecting to the right kind of functions and actually start executing something. Now, you then have to go to that platform to execute something. So, for example, the function might connect you to Expedia.com API, right? And then you can kind of go in there and you kind of try and do some very inefficient booking system, but it's quite limited. So now let's go back and think about this. So now you go in and you do exactly the same. You put in the objective, but this objective can be delivered to OpenAI LLM. It can be delivered to some other LLMs, multiple LLMs. And out of which comes the fact that your objective is related to, let's say, travel. First thing you understand is that it's a travel, and you're, you're not aware of this as a user, you're not aware of it. This is happening in the background. So what comes out of it is there is travel involved. You've kind of gone into that travel bucket. You then go and look for other specialist LLMs which have trained themselves to be more travel specific. You find one, but how do you find one? Is you have to have this search and discovery mechanism or a database of these LLMs, which you then connect to their agents to query them. So agent verse is the starting point of the Google of agents, for example. So that's probably the easiest way of saying it. It's a search engine which connects you when you need it to anything an agent can connect to. So in the first instance, you'll be connecting to a specific LLM, which is travel-based LLM, and you send the query into that LLM. So out comes again all the tasks. So let's say the tasks are book a hotel from this date to this date, or two people, or a business kind of trip, or you know a pleasure trip, do this, book a flight, book a transit from airport to the hotel. So all these things are now broken down. So now what you do is you say, okay, my first task is I want to book a flight. So you go into this marketplace, which is the agent verse, and you say, hey, I need to book a two tickets, business class from Toronto to London. Who is there? to fulfill my requirement. Now, at this point in time, there's nothing because everybody is just their own person. So you need this ability to connect to the agents on the other side, but how do you find them? And that's the job of the agent verse. So effectively, agent verse, you don't even need to see agent verse. It's just showing you that things are coming online. Actually, once everybody's using this technology, nobody should go to agent verse to see anything. Because there is nothing to see. All happens is your agent says, I need tickets. What's the best price? Uh, what's the availability? And those who have the availability respond to you by saying, yes, we can do two tickets, this, this price. And you get the option. You say, yeah, this one. And it goes and books it because it already has control of your credit card because you have granted it. It gets a confirmation and you book it. But there has to be a place where these agents can actually meet. They can send a query, they can actually receive a request and can be connected to execute this task. And that's the purpose of Agentverse. You have an agent which has the control of the whole objective and then you have these micro agents which are doing micro tasks. So you have multiple tasks getting delivered and these tasks then get executed each one by one, either parallel or serial fashion because, you know, unless you have the flight, you don't want to book a hotel. So once you've confirmed the flight, then you can say, okay, now I can give you options of the hotels. I have these three options because I don't need 10,000 options because out of the 10,000 options, which Google gives me, you know, they're all useless to me because it doesn't know I don't travel anything less than four star, for example. I'm not going to stay in a place which is less than four star, but I don't want to pay more than $200 a night, right? So all this context is built into your agent. And when it queries this whole place, it needs to find you three or five or 10. It depends on you. And that's a very simple example, but you can add complication. You can build different layers on top of it. You know, you want to be traveling, you want to be doing other things. So all of that needs to be in a marketplace where all these services are available. 
and your agent can go and connect to them. And that's agentless. How do the agents or how does the AI or agents, whatever you want to call it, how does it know your personal preferences? Like, is that just through going through emails, trial and error, like how, you know, notes, do you feed it data? Like how does it pull data to know what Matt or Humayun wants when it comes to traveling or eating or whatever the case may be? How does it learn about you? Yeah, it's all of those things. But the best thing is that you tell it because then you'll tell it exactly what you want. Right. We're not trying to listen in to anybody's conversation to guesstimate what they want. Why? Because we're not trying to sell advertising. So we don't need to listen in. You want a task to be done, then you are happy to feed in your preferences. So I don't get it wrong, right? If I'm an agent, you're feeding me the information. You know, we, we generally travel to people. We prefer Chinese food. We don't like, you know, some other food, Indian food or something. And you can give the preferences and it already learns from it. And then it can also do reinforcement learning because when you reject a task, it kind of trains its model to understand what, you know, so if 10,000 people rejected a task, what other things they would have liked or not liked. So you could, your agent can actually fall on to that kind of collaborative model, which teaches them what to offer you when you have a request, when you have an objective. But obviously this is a complete paradigm shift. So it will take its time Because you won't be very comfortable just saying to your agent, oh yeah, you can deal with everything. That's not going to be possible. So what would happen is that you will actually have to nurture your agents, train them. You have to say, ah, you know, here's my agent. This is representing me. I mean, people use different words. There's a distinction, but digital twin, for example, you're going to train your agent, your digital twin. And then suddenly that agent goes out and starts fulfilling the request your objective in the right way. So cool. I can't wait till all this stuff pops off and goes incredibly mainstream. I just think it'll make our lives incredibly more efficient and enjoyable. I, I do. I think it's going to remove a lot of a lot of friction. Absolutely. And a lot of the a lot of the nonsense that that we currently deal with. My only worry, and it's not really a worry, but because again, I'm selfishly here, only thinking of myself. But uh, I believe that I will, you know, continue to work hard enough and learn what I need to in order to not be replaced by AI. But I do worry that millions of people will be jobless because there's so many entry level jobs, perhaps customer service related jobs, task related jobs that will now be nullified because this technology is so powerful, which is really cool to see. But let's take a quick moment to jump into sort of the intersection of AI and crypto and how you guys are also moving and grooving in this. I know that you guys have uh, announced the development of a new suite of agent-based trading tools for decentralized exchanges. Give me a quick overview of what you and the team are working on in that regard and the whole intersection of crypto slash blockchain and AI as a whole. Let's start with the technology because crypto is seen as the tokens. So let's park the tokens aside for the minute. Let's start with the blockchain technology itself. Why is the intersection important? So the two main reasons which I'm kind of going to focus on here. One is, let's imagine this world where all these agents are going around, right? And you ask an agent to do something and there's a transaction which happens. And so this agent is going to go and say, hey, this LLM, are you able to give me this information? It takes that information. Or can you give me a prediction of like a, like 10 people have created recommender uh, models and your agent can go to every one of them or just one of them based on what the agent has been trained to do. But that recommender engine will have to be paid somehow. The transaction will have to be recorded somehow. And if you're going to run an open system where you're enabling everybody to deploy their models and everybody to deploy their services on this decentralized kind of platform, you need to have a ledger. You need to have a some network which is open. So the first part of this whole puzzle is you need a mechanism to record all these transactions. And I don't need to convince anybody here, blockchain has proven itself to be one of the best kind of ways to do it. Uh, Yes, it's heavy in terms of actually holding the data, but you don't have to put all the data on it. But you can monitor transactions, you can create an audit trail. So the regulator comes and says, why was this transaction done? You can go back and you can see, okay, this was transaction between this party and this party. 
these are wallets, right? Or agent addresses. And if you really need it to disclose the information, then you are able to do it. Or you can create identities, the self-sovereign identities, which sit on these agents slash wallets slash, you know, these accounts to actually provide that audit trail. So that's that's a very important part because if if this space kind of really blows up and you start using agents, there will be initial problems. There will be long-term problems. You need to monitor it all rather than saying, oh, well, it's a black box in a big corporate's control and we don't know whose data we trained on. So we can't really give you any information or we can't really incentivize people to do anything because we're just using everybody's data for free. So that excuse goes away. And then you have this whole agent needs to be interacting with each other. They need to keep a record. And if the system is going to be a huge system, it needs an orchestration kind of layer, which blockchain can provide quite easily. And and it's in control of not one party. It's in control of all the people who are actually part of this network. So And they can also have economic benefit. They can have a financial gain by hosting this rather than just one corporate. Which brings me back to your concern about, okay, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. Yes and no, because the jobs will become different because you have the same people who are a consumer, the same people could, and if the technology barrier is lowered, that you can host a node and you can host this network, you can actually start generating revenue out of the consumption, which you're also part of. So there is a financial reward mechanism, which also comes with tokens, which now I'm bringing the token side here, which is the tokenization either of the network, of the service, of the query, of the data, of the training of the model. You could actually create tokenized machine learning models, which people can use. But such a network, is it's a huge undertaking for any company to kind of take on. That sounds, I mean, how does one even get started in that capacity? Like that's bananas, no? No, it's quite, it's quite, it will be made quite easy. So you'll be able to either provide your data because you're a consumer. You don't have to give your actual identity details. You can have anonymized training of machine learning models. I mean, we do that all the time, even now. I mean, you set up you set up a Gmail account, you set up a Microsoft account. That's how easy it should be. And you say, okay, I'm going to do that, and that's it. You're now part of the network. Setting up an agent should not be sitting there writing a code. Setting up an agent is defining an objective to an interface. So a user interface could be a textual interface, could be a voice interface. You ask for something, and your agent you know, without you knowing, is created, is deployed, is looking for services for you, providing you those services, and in doing so, training a model which could actually generate revenue for you. So cool. Humane, you have been uh, a pleasure to speak with and have taught me an incredible amount today. I definitely have some homework to do. I will actually be jumping into some homework right after this. Before you go, can you bless us with a couple hot takes that, uh, preferably AI-related hot takes, can be anything, the spicier the better, but give us a couple of AI-related hot takes before you go, and then we'll do a quick outro and wrap everything up. Right, so I feel the AI space is going to explode a lot more, and I think people should not be scaremongering. I think we should be getting engaged because that's the only way not to be kind of scared of this. We're releasing tools at the moment, which we are probably the first one kind of know this, uh, in, in the next coming few weeks, we will be opening up our platform, which will kind of showcase most of the things we talked about. And you'll be able to create integrations, uh, carry out tasks. And I feel that's where the world is going to go. So if you're going to put your kind of trust into something, which is going to be the compute is going to be coming, it's going to be commoditized, but there's a huge value in deploying maybe some GPUs at home and getting them ready for machine learning models to be trained because there's a decentralized wave which is coming where you could generate revenue using that. So I would I would say that's a very interesting approach and angle. One should kind of get involved in it. But just to wrap it up, there is quite a lot of hype and not everything is as useful as it might appear in the first instance. So... Yeah, be careful out there. 
Well said, mate. Humane, what an episode. Really appreciate you coming on and honestly motivated me as well to get my ducks in a row and keep uh, putting the hammer down and, and getting better, doing more research, practicing, fooling around and just becoming more immersed with, uh, with AI. So when everything pops off, I will not be left behind. And to all the listeners, hopefully Humayun also motivated you as well to get your ducks in a row and make shit happen. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate this. Before we let you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and fetch.ai online and on socials? Yeah, thank you, Matt. It was a, you know, great questions. And I'm, I'm, I always enjoy speaking to somebody who's kind of really engaged in terms of finding more information, as you say, fetch.ai is the website. Not everything is there. We have some docs in a separate link up there. If you go in, you'll see the links. But for those who are not overly technical, we will be releasing uh, plenty of things in the coming weeks. Follow us on Twitter. We're also on Telegram. Send us an email if you want to get engaged, if you want to write some code for us or you know, be part of this new paradigm shift that is coming join us you know we have discord channel we have a github you can get engaged in all those ways we're really happy to hear from developers non-developers people who have businesses business ideas they want to deploy we're open and uh, ready to kind of interact with you guys love that thanks again mate really appreciate it and uh, cannot wait to have you on for round two in the near future thank you Thank you for listening, guys. Folks, what an episode with Humayun Sheikh, founder and CEO of Fetch.ai, dropping knowledge bombs left, right, and center. If you like AI and you like crypto, which most of us listeners probably do, this episode was an absolute treat. Huge shout out to both teams for making this happen. If you guys enjoyed this one, and I hope you did, please do subscribe. It would truly mean the world to my team and I. Speaking of the team, love you guys so much. Thank you so much for everything. Eustace, my amazing editor for the pod. You are the GOAT. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything. And to the listeners, love you guys. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon. Ciao.